Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending April 4th. First up, this is from theguardian.com. Bird backpacks help scientists discover the longest overseas migration. This is a bird that scientists have been disputing about for a lot of years. Some scientists believed that this bird actually traveled 1,500 miles nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. The name of this bird is the Black Pole Warbler. And so they wanted to do some kind of a test, but the problem is this bird is so small it weighs 12 grams, and there's no way they could put some kind of a backpack with a transmitter receiver on it. So what they decided to do instead was take a little half gram recorder, and basically it's just a recorder and light sensor with a built-in clock, and uh, they could keep the size small that way without having any kind of electronics for transmitting and receiving, and they would put this on birds. In fact, they put it on 20 birds, in Vermont and 20 birds in Nova Scotia and to track them to see if they actually made a trip across the Atlantic Ocean and uh, it was uh, even at the half gram weight of this uh, little transmitter compared to their 12 grams weight they were kind of concerned because they figured about half of the birds probably would not make the the trip anyway only about 50 percent of these birds that actually make the trip uh, to start out for this trip actually make it to their final destination in South America and uh, because of the fact that it didn't have a transmitter, that meant they have to try to recapture the birds when they arrive back again next year at the same place. So out of the 40 birds, they did manage to get a few of them and capture them. And it's really interesting the way this gadget works to be able to determine where the birds are in their location. It has an accurate clock, so by determining the sunrise each day, by, because this thing does sense when when light happens, so it's the light sensor itself can tell when the sun has risen. Uh, that tells them where the uh, longitude is and where the location of the birds are. And then to dis, to uh, determine the latitude, it would be the length of the day. So just using a, an accurate clock and a uh, light sensor, they were able to do that. And these birds evidently fly for two to three days nonstop from uh, starting out from the northeast part of America and parts of Canada and fly nonstop all the way to Puerto Rico and Cuba for their first rest stop and then on to the northern part of South America at the end. And uh, these, the one thing that also, um, a couple of hints that um, gave the scientists some hope that they were correct about them taking a completely water route and not stopping was the fact that some of the birds had landed on ships uh, in the uh, out in the Atlantic Ocean too, so and the fact that they gained almost double their weight, so the birds ate so much just before their trip that they doubled in size. So they figured these birds were preparing for quite a long journey. So this is kind of interesting article if you get a chance to check it out. And as usual, all the links will be down below. These next two articles are from my friend Navy Thomas Eight. This first one is from Science Recorder: Flying Submarine Drone Named Wanda Being Developed by U.S. Navy. Folks over at the National Research Laboratory have been creative. They're developing a new drone submarine. They're also calling it a flimmer, a flying swimmer. And this thing um, can uh, either land on the water gently or dive underwater. So it's got underwater capability of uh, 11 miles per hour. And it's got flying capability of 57 miles per hour. When it gets airborne, it has two little uh, bendable fins on the tips of the wings that uh, come up to vertical stance and give it some uh, better control for in the air so kind of a sneaky little deal to be able to um, stealthily get into closer to your enemy without being aware so uh, that's kind of a cool development there and then next from LiveScience.com woolly mammoth DNA inserted into elephant cells uh, working more and more into a project that I've always been interested in following since a young kid the possible resurrection of the woolly mammoth but uh, scientist George Church, who is also, he's known for a project to uh, resurrect the passenger pigeon, too, which I think is um, something I would really like to see come about. But what they're doing right now is they're doing it in steps, which is kind of, I think, a, a kind of a neat, different idea. He's taking uh, and recreating some of the mammoth cells for things like uh, hair length, subcutaneous fat, uh, small ears, things like that, just uh, things to make the appearance of a mammoth. So what they're going to do is test these out in an artificial womb rather than they said it was unethical maybe to try to do this with a regular live elephant, um, do these kind of tests. But what I think they're gearing up to do, and they're talking about this with the passenger pigeon too, is more or less take an elephant or take a pigeon, a common pigeon that's around now, and make them for all appearances, at least external appearances, appear like the original animal more than actually be the original animal. So I think they're more working on a, 
a future elephant that would actually have the outside hair, or maybe larger tusks, um, the different kind of appearances like that. Um, so that would be the, in, in that case, they would be doing it that way, and it would be more like an appearance of the original animal more than the original animal itself, and then maybe eventually working on uh, something more than that. And this next one is from two people, actually. Catherine S. posted this on the Dumpster Diver Facebook group page. Thank you for doing that. And my friend Tony F. sent this article, too, from RT.com. All about that base. Sound-based fire extinguisher puts out flames. Two engineering students from George Mason University are using the unique power of sound to put out flames. These are engineering students Viet Tran and Seth Robertson. And I'll put a little bit of the video up here. They just take this uh, base transducer and just use the air pulses to separate the flames. It looks like what they're doing is lighting a pan of maybe diesel fuel or kerosene, something like that. It doesn't seem quite as flammable as gas, but they're using the base pulses to uh, take the flames and separate them from the fuel source. Um, they're talking about using this to put out large forest fires. I don't really see it um, used that way. It can be, it can have some special uses, and they're talking about, you know, putting it on um, drones well, if, if you were to put it on drones, it still couldn't be very big or weigh very much because you can't have drones even carry um, extinguishing type of chemicals, and at least not any amounts of them to really do good for a fire. But if they could carry a transducer that would be effective, what I would have the drones do is surround the forest fire and uh, keep, a, keep a watch on the grassland areas because a lot of times forest fires will jump from one area of trees to another across a grassland because of the sparks being carried by the air. If you could have a flock of drones, say 20 or 30 of them, and keep them airborne for hours and hours, and they could spot little patches of flame where the grasslands are catching on fire, and then use these transducers to put out these small flames, that could keep the fire, at least keep it in check while the firefighters can take care of the one area and not have it spread to other areas. At least that's my idea of it. And also, in special cases like in a laboratory setting or something like that, where you'd want to extinguish a fire but not contaminate stuff with chemicals and things like that in a laboratory setting, you could have these be the first line of defense. Or say like in a, in a kitchen, they mentioned this too, in like a, a kitchen where you don't want a lot of chemicals around and things like this, you could have one of these transducers as the first line. And then if for some reason the fire still wasn't put out by the um, base transducers, then you would have the, the chemical or water extinguisher stuff like that kick in as the second line of defense. But yeah, I think for specialty cases this could be pretty good. So anyway, I hope everybody has a happy Easter. Take care everybody and I will catch you next week.